right, I want to go from uh, 1 Peter 1, verse 13 to... I want to go through to 21. So it says, Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each uh, one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed for the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Let me pray. Uh, God, I just want to thank you for uh, City Ridge Church and for the way that it's affected so many people um, as a church planning network, but also as a church that was so instrumental um, in my life and um, in my marriage and the way that I treat people. And we just pray that this morning City Ridge would be being blessed by um, David Chesson as he preaches and many people who are serving there. I pray that as team of preachers, would you move powerfully this morning? Uh, would you give him the words to speak, the clarity of mind, and would you glorify yourself through the preaching of your word? Mm-hmm. And the people said? Amen. 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 Thank you, brother. Hello. Can Hello. you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Good, good, good. It's so such a privilege to be with you here today. And uh, as Carl said, um, we, we served alongside of each other in ministry and it was a real joy and it is and one of I've been in ministry at Oakton a city which Oakton for 11 years and uh, many you know there's many different things in ministry it's, sometimes ministry is difficult uh, there's many joys as well but one of the greatest joys is seeing um, people who you've invested in take the next step and grow in ministry and be sent out and, and do things and so it's just a real privilege to be with you here today and I'm just hoping but as we open the Bible, it's not working. <laughs> this is church planting Bible. Just think you're going to enjoy the Okay. There you go. I think you can hear me. Awesome. <laughs> So anyways, so I'm just hoping that today as we open God's word together that, that I'll fade into the background and you will see the glory and greatness of Jesus in this text. So if you look down in your Bible, so let's, so let's just get straight into it, hey? So let's do it. So if you look down in your Bibles in verse 13, Peter begins with the word, therefore. Now the word, therefore, is a word that summarizes everything that's gone before and says on the basis of everything that's gone before, this is now what I want you to do. Now, Peter opened this letter by giving his readers hope despite their present circumstances. Uh, Peter was writing to Christians who were suffering from extreme persecution. The year was AD 65. Emperor Nero, he'd become emperor in Rome, and this tsunami of persecution had begun in Rome that was about to crash across the rest of the empire. So it was spreading across the rest to Asia Minor, where Peter is writing this letter to Christians in that area. And so Peter reminds his readers just earlier in the chapter, from verses 3 to 13, of the living hope that they have in Jesus because of his resurrection from the dead. But in this passage that we're going to be looking at this morning, Peter moves now from instruction to application. He moves from the indicative, meaning he moves from what is true, now to the imperative, here's how you need to live. Now, when it comes to how to live as a Christian, sometimes we can be very confused. We know that Jesus is coming to take us back to be with him, but how should we live as Christians in the world? Now, some Christians, in response to this, they adopt what I will will call a retreat mentality. How do we remain pure in this world when we need to retreat from the world? Now, this started pretty early in church history. In the third third and fourth century, there would be these desert 
um, hermits. They would escape into caves. There was one guy who stood on a pole for two years thinking that he was being holy, separating himself from society. Now, while as evangelicals, we would think that's ridiculous, and I don't think that probably there's anyone here this morning who's a doomsday prepper. Is there anyone here this morning like that who has a bunker and, or, uh, you know, in your house because you're, you're preparing for the apocalypse? Well, I don't think, you know, we are like that. I think we can often adopt the same posture. We can often become Christians who think that the way to remain pure is by separating, by retreating. And so we'll only have Christian friends. We'll only listen to Christian music. We'll watch Christian movies. We'll we'll allow our kids to watch Veggie Tales instead of The Wiggles. We'll have, we'll use testaments. Do you know what testaments are? I once saw them at um, Kurong. They're these like breath mints, like testaments. (laughs) They're like um, these breath mints, you know. Uh, Fresh breath with a powerful message. Get your testaments today. You know, sometimes we are like that. The only problem with the retreat mentality is that if you separate yourself too far from society, you will never have an impact on anything. And one of the saddest realities nowadays is that most non-Christians have never met an authentic, real deal Christian. They've never, and so they, in their mind, their pictures of Christians come from basically the media. And so if we want to make an impact, we can't make an impact by retreating into our own Christian ghettos where we feel safe. I know it's so easy to do that nowadays with everything that's happening. It's so easy to think, nah, just, let's just batten down the hatches. Let's just retreat. But that's never going to make an impact. We're never going to make an impact for Christ. Well, on the other hand, other people, they adopt a relevant mentality. How do we engage with the culture? We try and be relevant, we try and be cool. I was reading a church website this week, and in the website, it had, it had um, this, is, this, is, this was, the, um, this was the, the saying on the website, it was like, this ain't your grandmother's church, although she is invited, all right? <laughs> this ain't your grandmother's church. And the idea behind that is, this isn't our daggy old church, we, we're relevant, baby. You come, you come be a part of our church, we're a relevant church. Now, I'm not saying that we be irrelevant. Like, you know, I, I think we need to have a look at our forms as a church and, and, and play music that people will want to listen to. I don't think anyone here has organ music in their, in their you know, their collection, their music collection. Anyone, anyone like organ music from the 16th to 17th century? Oh, one person. There we go. There you go. <laughs> not mo- well, most of us don't. And so I, do, I think we do need to look at our forms and determine what forms can be helpful. And we need to answer the questions that people are asking. Like oftentimes preachers uh, answer questions that nobody's asking. And so, you know, that, 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 that's not helpful. But, you know, in the end, the message that we preach, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians, will be foolishness to Greeks and it'll be a stumbling block to the Jews. And the message of the cross is an unpopular message. It just is. It says that, you know, you're a sinner. You need salvation. You're under God's judgment. And apart from Christ, you will not be saved. And so I don't think relevance is going to do it for this, for this church. I don't think City Light East. I don't think you can have the best music, the best coffee, everything. I don't think it's going to do it. So I'm I don't think a, 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 a retreat mentality is going to work. I don't think a relevance mentality is going to work. So how do we relate to the culture around us? Well, what Peter teaches us in 1 Peter is he says, we need to become strangers and exiles. We are to live in this world for Jesus as his people in this world for his glory. And Peter uses one particular word that you probably haven't heard used like this before in this passage to describe that posture, and it's the word holy, holy. How are we to live? We are to live as God's holy people. Now, just think about it for a moment. Is that a word that your wife or your husband would use to describe you? My, my husband is a holy husband. Is that a word that your children would use to describe you? My mum or my dad, they're holy. Would that be a word that your, your friends, when they think of you, they think this person is a holy person? Well, what is holiness and how do we actually pursue holiness practically in our lives? Well, that's what I want to look at this morning. So first, what does it mean to be holy? Look down your Bibles in verse 14. Peter says, as obedient children, 
Do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Now, the word holy in Greek is the Greek word hagios. It means distinct. It means different. Um, And Peter is basically saying, because you are now God's child, you are to live a distinctive life, a different life in all of your conduct. Because God is holy, you are to be holy. Now, what, what do we mean when we say God is holy? Well, one of my professors at Dallas Seminary, where I trained to be a pastor, Dr. Lawrence, he once said that God's holiness can be defined this way. God is holy in all that he is, thinks, feels, says, does, and wills. That's a pretty, pretty expansive definition. Thinks, feels, says, does, wills is inherently and eternally good and right, and in that he is inherently and eternally free from evil of any kind. So God's holiness is an intrinsic holiness, meaning that it's an essential attribute of his nature. And only God is inherently holy meaning that his holiness is one of his permanent characteristics. The Bible says he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so he is always holy. And this absolute holiness of God cannot be imparted to us. A.W. Tozer, the great author, writes this, God is holy with an absolute holiness that knows no degrees, and this cannot be imparted to his creatures. See, God is distinct. He is different. There is the creator God, and then there is creation. And there is a sense in which God in his holiness, we will never share in that absolute holiness of God. Listen to these words from Paul to Timothy in 1 Peter 5. He says, Blessed be the only sovereign, King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light. There is this sense that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit dwell in this sense of intrinsic holiness that they alone share with one another that we will never know anything about. That's how awesome and powerful and mighty God is. But even though God's holiness is unique to him, there is a human holiness to which we can obtain. Um, Dr. Lawrence once again stated in his class this, We can be holy in that we must be dedicated to purity as God defines it in his word in every aspect of our being, thought, attitude, word, desire, and deed, and that we must be consecrated from impurity as God defines it in his word in every aspect of our being, thought, attitude, word, desire, and deed. So we can be like God in that we can be holy as he defines it. Created in his image, we can be holy like him. So let me ask you a good question. Are you like that? Are you dedicated to what God defines holiness to be? In your being, in your thoughts, your actions, your words, your deeds, you're dedicated to holiness as he defines it. And you're against impurity as he defines it in his word. So how do you develop holiness? That's our second question. How do you develop and pursue a life of holiness? Well, Peter tells us that it starts with our minds, it leads to our desires, and then flows out into our behavior. You see, if you want to change this morning, you will never change unless that change begins with your mind, it leads to a change of desires in your heart, which leads to your behavior. Many Christians think, that they will change, that the way to change is just to will it in. It's just, it's just to, just to try harder, do more, but that won't lead to true transformation in the inner self. You see, the Bible is clear that the pattern is it begins in your mind. It leads to transformed desires, which then leads to a change of behavior. You see, notice in verse 13, Peter begins, he says, prepare your minds for action. You see, if you want to pursue holiness, it begins with your mind. It begins with your thinking. Now, if you translate this phrase literally from the original language, it comes out like this. Gird up 
the loins of your mind. <laughs> now, that's how, it's, that's how it's translated in the King James Version. Uh, probably no one has a King James here this morning. Yeah, maybe some do. Maybe some of you do. But um, that's how it's translated in the King James Version. And uh, we don't speak that way anymore. Gird up the loins of your mind. But it's a, it's a very vivid image. You see, in the first century, uh, if you, you know, what people wore is they wore tunics and they would wear a belt. Uh, and if they wanted to get themselves prepared for strenuous action or activity, they wanted to run somewhere, they would have to get their tunic and they would tuck it into their belt. And that was girding up their loins. And so this was a colloquial expression at the time for getting serious, for getting yourself ready. And so Peter says, we need to get our minds ready. And then notice he goes on to say, he says, uh, prepare your minds for actions. Then he says, be sober-minded. In the, in the original language, in the Greek New Testament, it's like this. It's like two commands. Gird up the loins of your mind, be sober-minded. It's, like it's like a shotgun. He's saying, get yourself ready. Get your thinking ready. You know, as Thomas Schreiner says, thinking in a new way does not happen automatically. It requires effort, concentration, and intentionality. So the process <clears throat> of pursuing holiness begins with your mind. As Paul would say in Romans 12 verse 2, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. An undisciplined mind will never lead to a holy life. As Steve Covey once said, you sow a thought, you reap an action. You sow an action, you'll reap a habit. You sow a habit, you'll reap a character. And you sow a character, you'll reap a destiny. You know, it is quite scary to realize that the place where you are today is a result of your past thinking. Your past thoughts have sowed actions. Your actions have reaped habits. Your habits have reaped a character an automatic way of responding to the situations and circumstances around you. I remember someone once saying to me, Timon, if you want to become a better leader, you need to monitor your thoughts. Where do your thoughts go in those private moments? Just before you go to bed, what do you think about? When you wake up in the morning, what's the first thing on your mind? When you're walking along and you have nothing else to think about, what do you dwell upon? You see, as Shriner states, if you're going to be a holy, holy Christian, it starts with your thinking, and this requires effort, concentration, and intentionality. Now, what in particular are we to think about? What are we to concentrate our thinking on? Well, Peter says, set your hope fully on the grace to be given you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, Peter is not just wanting us here to become people who are intellectually fascinated by end times theology. Fascination will never lead to transformation. What he is saying, rather, is he wants us to focus on the fact that when Jesus comes back, we're going to receive grace, not wrath. We're not going to be under God's wrath because we're his children. We're going to be under his grace. And he says that this will motivate us towards holiness. Now, how does it do this? Well, Pastor Brian Chappell wisely tells us this. He says, we love God most deeply, most compulsively, when the reality of his grace overwhelms us and when we love him deeply, we will desire to walk with him closely and honor him daily. So a person whose mind is set fully on the hope of future grace, a person who's rehearsing the grace of God and celebrating the grace of God will be a person who is hungering after holiness and hungering after God. And this is all important to be fueling your desires because as I said before, it's out of your desires that your behavior comes. Notice Peter says in verse 14, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Now, when you come to Christ, it's not as though all your sinful um, desires from the past are eradicated. You know, some are. Some people, when they become a Christian, they find that just becoming a Christian means that these past desires that they had are just completely gone. I remember I took this one guy out once for lunch and he was, in, he was a friend of mine. And he said, the moment, the moment I became a Christian, I had no longer any desire to smoke. Just went like that. I said, but how are you going with lust? He said, well, I can't control my eyes. You see, while it's true that some of our desires change, not all will change at once. 
You know, I, I had a friend of mine who came to me recently and they said, I don't know what's going on. I become a Christian and I know that pornography is wrong. I know I shouldn't look at it, but I still desire to. Well, that is because when you come to Christ, your desires do change. As Peter says in verse 14, we do desire to be obedient children. The Holy Spirit comes into our lives. He brings this new love for God and a new love for His ways as His child. But it's not as though all your past desires are completely eradicated. You have new desires for obedience, but you still have these old desires of former ignorance, as Peter says. And so what you need to do is not be conformed, as Peter says. You need to not be conformed to those old desires. So how do you do it? Well, there was this old Eskimo fisherman who would come to town every Saturday afternoon. And he always brought two, two dogs with him. One was white and the other was black. And he had taught these dogs to fight on command. Every Saturday afternoon in the town square, the people would gather and these two dogs would fight and the fishermen would take bets on which one would win. On one Saturday, the black dog would win. Another Saturday, the white dog would win. But guess what? The old Eskimo fisherman, he always bet on the right dog. <laughs> and his friends became very intrigued. And they asked him, how did he do it? How did he know which dog would win in the fight? And the Eskimo said, well, I starve one and I feed the other. The one I feed always wins because it is stronger. You know, the desires that you feed will be the ones that win. You know, your behavior comes out of your desires. It comes out of your heart. And so if you want to make progress in holiness, it begins as the writer of Proverbs says in Proverbs 4 verse 23, to guard your heart because out of it will flow the issues of life. You need to starve ungodly desires and sow to the Spirit, as Paul says in Galatians 6 verse 7. You see, if you have a problem with pornography here today, don't view hours and hours of unfiltered television. Even though what you may be watching may not be bad, you may be fueling ungodly desires. If you struggle with anxiety, don't go on Google and Google all your symptoms and go searching endless websites as to what may be wrong with you. You'll just be fueling that anxiety in your heart. One of my friends, uh, uh, Marilyn Teague, she's a, a great friend of mine. She's involved in OCF, Overseas Christian Fellowship. And one day, one of her friends came to her and said, Marilyn, you need to watch this amazing television show, Downton Abbey. Who here likes Downton Abbey? You know, I, my wife and I have watched it. You know, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's something. Um, <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and so she, it was a Thursday night, so she watched Downton Abbey, and she enjoyed it. As, you know, period piece, all that sort of stuff. She enjoyed watching it. But the next day she got up, it was Friday, and she went to prayer, and she just found she couldn't pray. Well, her, her mind kept on thinking about all these scenes in Downton Abbey and all of that sort of stuff. She just couldn't enjoy sweet fellowship with Jesus. And so she decided, I'm not going to watch Downton Abbey ever again. Now, that's not legalism, my friends. That's biblical Christianity. She disciplined her mind to set it on the right things so that her desires could be fueled for Jesus because she loves Jesus. You see, this is how you're really transformed. It's not by putting yourself under law. You won't be transformed that way. It's actually by starting in your minds, setting your mind on the grace of God, setting your mind on the truth of God. Yesterday, I, I've been going through some stuff in my life personally. And yesterday, I just took some of the promises of Scripture and I just read them through like 200 times to set my mind in the right place on God's truth. Because what you set your mind on will change your desires, which will lead to a change in behavior. But there is something else that Peter tells us will help us in this passage, in the pursuit of holiness, that I think may have actually vanished from mainstream evangelicalism. Look down your Bibles in verse 17. Peter says, 
And if you call on him as father, now Peter is using the language of prayer here. One of the great privileges of a Christian is that God is our father. And as Jesus taught us to pray, our father who is in heaven. But if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, look what he says. He says, conduct yourselves with fear throughout your time of exile. You see, one of the things that I think has almost vanished from evangelicalism is this deep reverence for God. You know, Pastor Chuck Swindoll says this, people don't mind talking about the love, grace, mercy, and blessings of God, but to refer to God as judge who evaluates our work, this kind of thinking bothers a lot of people today, even Christians. See, where is the fear of God? Where is the reverential awe of who God is? You know, one of the greatest motivations towards holiness is fear of God. When, God. when fear of who God is breaks out, you know what happens? Revival happens. People fall on their knees and say, your God is worth serving. He's an awesome God. Paul Tripp in his book, Awe, he writes this, transgression is not first a law problem, but rather it is an awe problem. You know, many people, we, we don't have a problem with the law. We know what God says is right and wrong. It's an awe problem. Tripp goes on to say this. He says, when awe of anything but God kidnaps and controls your heart, you simply will not stay inside God's boundaries. But when a deep, reverential fear of God has captivated your heart, you will willingly and joyfully live inside the fences he has set for you. See, that's what I think that many of us need to recover this morning is awe of God. Now, there are two reasons that Peter gives us why we should have a reverential fear of God. The first reason, he says, as we've already looked at, is because God, our Father, is a judge. Now, as we've already said, we need to focus our minds on the grace of God. We are not under the eternal judgment of God because of Jesus, because he has satisfied God's wrath on our behalf. That means that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Can I get an amen? Amen. Does this church, amen? Yes? Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> amen. Amen. But it does say to even Christians that God is a judge, an impartial judge. Do you know a, a little trap that we can fall into, especially Christian leaders, is we can think because we serve God this way, somehow, somehow because we serve God and we've sacrificed for God, we can, you know, we don't have to play by his rules. We have this special thing with God. Because we made all this sacrifice for God, obedience is not that big a deal. But actually, the refrain of the Old Testament is what God says, is he says, I desire what? Obedience over sacrifice. What God wants is obedience. And as your father, he judges impartially. He's watching your life. And because he loves you, he will discipline he will discipline his children because he disciplines those he loves. And that can be a huge motivation towards holiness. When you're by yourself, all by yourself and no one else is around, recognize God, your father's there. He's watching. And you want to bring pleasure to his heart. You want to bring joy to the, the heart of the father. But the second reason that we should have a reverential fear of God is because of verse 18. Look down your Bibles. Conduct yourselves with fear during your time of exile, Peter says in verse 18, because we know that you were ransomed not from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. You see, your redemption was purchased by the precious blood of Jesus. You know, when I was studying this passage, I noticed something really cool in this verse. Peter, notice Peter is contrasting the blood of Christ with perishable things like silver and gold. Do you know what that means? It means that Christ's blood is imperishable. 
as the divine son of God who came in the incarnation as a man, his blood has infinite value. As Andre Crouch sang, the blood of Jesus shed for me way back on Calvary. The blood gives me strength from day to day. It will never lose its power. It reaches to the highest heavens. It flows to the lowest valley. The blood that gives me strength from day to day will never lose its power. And knowing the power of the blood should motivate us to have this deep fear of God. That God, the creator, the sustainer, the holy one that we've looked at, would send his only son to die for us, to redeem us out of futile ways. You know what the word futile means? It means meaningless, absolutely meaningless. You know, sin is pleasurable. It, does, it is pleasurable for a, for a season, but it will bring no meaning and no good in your life. And we've been redeemed from that by the precious blood of Jesus. One of my favorite books is C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia. And in this one scene in the book, the children Peter, Susan, and Lucy find out about Aslan. They're talking with Mr. Be- Beaver and they ask him, who is Aslan? And Lucy asks... Is he a man? Aslan a man? Said Mr. Beaver sternly. Certainly not. I tell you, he is the king of the wood and the son of the great emperor beyond the sea. Don't you know who the king of the beasts is? Aslan is a lion, the lion, the great lion. Oh, said Susan. I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? (laughs) I shall feel rather nervous meeting a lion. That you will, dearie. Make no mistake, said Mrs. Beaver. If there's anyone who can appear before Aslan without their knees knocking, they're either braver than most or sillier than most. Then he, he isn't safe. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Don't you hear what Mrs. Beaver's telling you? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. You know, I wonder, have you domesticated God this morning? Are you seeing him for who he truly is in his holiness and power and awesome might spiritual renewal will begin in your heart when you see both these two things together together the awesome greatness and holiness of god then the beauty of his love and grace for you without those two things there won't be any power there won't be any love There won't be any motivation towards holiness. Those two things come together. And so, City Light East, it's such a privilege to be here with you today. Such a privilege. And if there's anything that I could leave with you, don't just settle for being a church that's either retreating from the world or a church that's relevant. This ain't your grandma's church. (laughs) What you want to be as a church is a church that's holy. It's God's holy people. Where you have been gripped by his holiness, his greatness, his supreme love. And that has meant that you guys are motivated, not just here on Sunday to worship him, but every single day of your life, he's worthy of every praise, of every action, of every thought of obedience towards him. And you live for him. So I wonder today, as we finish, holiness begins with the mind. It heads to the desires and flows out into our behavior. Do you need to set your mind on some truth this week? Do you need to spend some time just rehearsing God's truth? Is there some, there might be some people here today and God doesn't even, no one around here knows what's going on in your life, but the Lord does. And he wants you to deal with it today. That precious blood has not lost its power. It can cleanse you this morning. It can transform you this morning. This morning can be the start of something new in your life. But you have to bring it out in the open. You have to say, God, I come clean. I'm real. God desires truth in the inner place. That's where he desires truth. That's where he desires reality. Do you need to bring it out in the open and say, Lord, I just come to you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I haven't been living your way. I want to live your way. I want to live for you because you're so good and so gracious, but also so holy. 
Let me pray. Oh, Father, we just come before you right now and we thank you for your word. I pray that it would have spoken to hearts, Lord, today. Lord, we just worship you and praise you and honor you. You're not safe. (laughs) We can't domesticate you. But you are good (laughs) and gracious. Father, we just come and we just lay ourselves bare before you and just pray that you in all of our hearts, you would just lead us back to the cross in confession and repentance, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together and let's sing that song, Worthy, Worthy of Every Song.